So welcome, welcome, welcome. It is one o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Uh, if you're logged into this Zoom session, you are attending and interested in the Firefighter Cancer Initiative's monthly seminar series. Um, so we have two of our guest speakers today. I am proud to introduce our moderator for today's seminar series, Dr. Natasha schaefer Sally, who serves as the FCI's Deputy Director. She'll be responsible today for our introduction of our presenters and moderating questions at the tail end. She'll have more instructions for you all. So we'll just give one additional minute for folks to trickle into the uh, Zoom meeting session, and then Dr. Sally will get us started. All right, sounds great. Uh, welcome everybody, happy January, happy new year. Um, we are really excited for today's talk. We're gonna be learning about nutrition in the fire service presented by Dr. Amy Green and Dr. Chris Paul. Um, a little background, so Dr. Uh, Paul is a primary care sports medicine physician, uh, went to medical school at University of Florida um, before completing both residency in family medicine and fellowship in sports medicine at the University of Miami. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine and Orthopedics. And additionally, he is a team physician for the University of Miami Athletics, Major League Baseball's Miami Marlins and US Olympic sailing team. He serves as our medical director of our FCI mobile clinic. And in addition, we have Dr. Amy Green, who serves as our nurse practitioner um, for the Firefighter Cancer Initiative. Her background is in health prevention and um, has, a, I want to say a hobby, uh, but a real interest in nutrition um, and has really taken the lead on our nutrition assessment uh, program for our firefighters. So without further ado, I will hand over the mic to Drs. Amy Green and Chris Polt, and I'm looking forward to hearing the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Sully. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for the slides. I go white. Dr. Green um, cues up her slides. Could you just double check audio there? It feels a little low on this end to make sure that Dr. Green has a strong mic. Can you guys see the screen? Not yet, you're not sharing yet. Okay, we see your slides, thank you. All right, thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? I can talk a little louder. You you sound awfully low, wherever, I don't know if the microphone is coming from Headbuzz headpiece or from the computer, but it's low. No, it's, it's not the headpiece, it's just the computer. Okay, so I would just speak up uh, louder because it seems very far away. Okay, let me know if at any point we can try to use, I mean, I can try to use the headset if that's. Sure, try to use the headset, that would work. Is this better? Yeah, okay, great. All right, so today we're gonna be talking about nutrition in the fire service and how we can leverage um, nutrition and diet, um, its influence over epigenetics, inflammation, and the microbiome. So first, we're going to get started right by talking about what we can't talk about. Uh, we can't talk about diet without talking about chronic disease, right? So how many people um, that are online with us know someone or maybe actually have a diagnosis of a chronic disease? I'll pause, right? So most of us can raise our hands, right? So when we look at the statistics in the U.S., about six in 10 um, adults in the U.S. will have at least one chronic disease and four in 10 will have actually two or more. And when we look at this list of chronic disease, right, we see on topping the list are heart disease and cancer. So what do heart disease and cancer have in common? And um, when we look at that, we look at risk factors, right? And one of the major risk factors that we look at is diet and its role um, in development of chronic disease, including cancer. So now moving right along, right? We wanna look at how are these um, chronic conditions actually affecting us? So how, what's, what's happening? Um, so these are actually mortality statistics for the US. And you see, again, topping the list are gonna be heart disease and cancer. 
and that similar interplay on the risk factors for both, which we're going to dive into on in the next few slides. So what are the key lifestyle risk factors for chronic disease? And I'm going to move this so you guys can see the slides a little bit better. Um, so these are, you know, four. I always, uh, when I present on anything nutrition or lifestyle related, I always say, you know, these are some earth shattering things that you've never heard about um, before, groundbreaking um, things that influence our health, right? And, and basically what we see are the biggest factors for chronic disease are going to be tobacco use, lack of physical activity, excessive alcohol use, and then that poor nutrition, which is what we're going to hone in on today. So when we talk about cancer, a lot of the um, language becomes that cancer is largely related to our genetics, right? So it's, you know, if you have a family history, um, it's kind of like something that you're going to inherit. And it's, it's your fate, it's your destiny, right? But when we look at the actual statistics, what we see is according to the National uh, Cancer Institute, um, only up to 10% of cancer is actually caused by a genetic mutation that was inherited, um, meaning that was something that you got through the genes that you got from your mom and your dad. Um, the rest of cancer, right? So the other 90%, um, are going to be related to what we call epigenetic changes, right? Which is a fancy way of saying how our environment interacts with our genetics, right? So we have these different lifestyle or environmental factors, right? We have lifestyle, things like physical activity. We have our environment. So the exposures that we're exposed to, be it through um, our air pollution, the water, you know, microplastics, all these different PFAS, right? We talk about all these different chemical exposures. We have different epigenetic changes that are also just related to aging. And then we have those that are related to our dietary influences. And that's what we're going to hone in on um, today. But basically what happens with epigenetic changes, um, all these influences have the potential to alter how our genes express themselves, right? So there's something called M or microRNA that basically codes for how genes influence, how genes express themselves, right? So does an actual genetic predisposition become actual disease? And what happens is from all these lifestyle influences, uh, it causes what we call genomic instability, right? So changes in um, these epigenetic markers that then can cause normal cells to turn into a cancer cell, right? So what we want to learn is how can we prevent this from happening um, and control of as much of these uh, epigenetic changes and prevent cancer. So there's two main um, factors that we're going to focus on today and how epigenetics interact with um, our actual manifestation of disease. And the two things that we're going to focus on is inflammation and the microbiome. So inflammation and cancer, right? So what do these two things have in common? So what we know about um, inflammation is basically inflammation to some extent is normal, right? So there's different factors that influence inflammation, right? These include um, physiologic and mental stress, environmental pollutants, again, right, we talked about that, um, things related to diet, and then also things like viruses and bacteria, right? So it's very normal. Part of a normal um, response of your immune system would be to react with acute inflammation when it comes in contact with a specific uh, bacteria or virus, right? There's an immune response that happens that's normal so that we can fight that disease process. However, what happens nowadays with um, these chronic exposures, um, be it through diet and again, the environment, um, then we enter into what we call a state of chronic inflammation, right? So during an inflammatory response that the body is mounting towards, again, if it's normal virus or bacteria, now abnormal, we talk about chronic inflammation, there's an increase in what we call reactive oxygen species, right? Which these are just cells that um, are unbalanced that are looking for another cell to take from, right? So they're kind of like a cell that's gone rogue. And then we look at different inflammatory markers, right? Different cytokines are interleukins or TNF-alpha um, inflammatory cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines, right? 
And all of these increase during an immune response, which is normal when it's an acute immune response. When it becomes pathologic is when that immune response turns into a chronic immune response or a chronic state of inflammation, right? So that leans itself towards this tumor proliferation, growth, um, and the potential for cancer through the mechanism of inflammation. So this is basically what it looks like, um, what systemic chronic inflammation looks like. So on the left, you have the causal factors. So what causes systemic chronic inflammation? Right there, you're gonna see it again. Diet, um, gut dysbiosis. So we're gonna talk about the microbiome and how our diet influences the microbiome and then uh, link that to inflammation. Things like physical inactivity, um, chronic infections. So sometimes we can have low-lying chronic infections that our body uh, affects the immune system. Um, things like disturbed sleep, right? Because that's going to affect our body's ability to actually function at its optimal capacity in uh, its immune system. And xenobiotics and different environmental exposures. So that's what you see on the left that are triggers for this systemic chronic infection. And then what you see on the right is the manifestation. So I give the example sort of like an iceberg. And, you know, what you see, the iceberg is disease, right? So you see that cancer diagnosis, you see that cardiovascular disease, that autoimmune condition, diabetes, depression, mental health, right? But what you're seeing, what you're not seeing below the surface that's under the water is this low lying systemic chronic inflammation by all these um, lifestyle factors, a key factor being our nutrition, that has the power to either promote this uh, systemic chronic inflammation, therefore leading to disease, or actually um, prevents it. So what about the microbiome? What's the microbiome's role in all of this? So first of all, what is the microbiome, <laughs> right? So the microbiome is basically, in short, some microbes that live on us and in us, right? And they can either be in a state of balance, right? So we can either have good microbial state and diversity in our microbiome, or we can have what we call dysbiosis, right? And dysbiosis is basically when the microbes that live on us are not um, not the best for us and, and basically can promote disease. Where are some of the common places we have? Um, these commensal, right, good bacteria. Um, a common one, right, that we think of um, right off the bat is always the gut. The gut and the mouth are tied, right? So there is an oral microbiome when we talk about links to like cardiovascular disease and and uh, oral health, right? What is the interplay with the um, oral microbiome? And then we have other, you know, areas such as the urogenital, our skin, respiratory tract, et cetera. Um, and these are all places where we have these microbes that are there to protect us. So what microbes are there to protect us? This is a very busy um, picture, but it's a really good image showing us um, basically the importance of gut microbial diversity, right? So when we talk about disease prevention, when we talk about diet, um, what we want to focus on is a diet that promotes gut microbe diversity. Um, and if you see on the top, right, you see those little thin orange lines, what we see is that gut microbial diversity has a negative association with pretty much every chronic disease. Um, and when you go to the next line, right, you see specific microbes, right? So there's certain microbes that actually have a positive association with disease and then those that have a negative association with disease, right? So we think about um, good, you know, bacteria, things that we want on us that have a negative correlation with disease, right? Things like our lactobacilli, our bifidobacter. Um, and then you um, think about things that we don't want on us that actually can promote disease, right? So we think about our clostridium, um, our klebsiella, our enterobacter, um, et cetera, right? So we want to have the the diversity, um, but we also want to have the right strains. Um, and we do that by the influence that we can leverage um, with our diet. And we'll talk a little bit about more about that. Um, 
this is basically showing how the interplay of the microbiome. So this ties it back into how our um, diet ties into our microbiome and then um, influences inflammation and then pathogenesis specifically related to cancer, right? So how does, what is, what is my, what I eat and my inflammation level and my um, microbiome have to do with me getting cancer. Like I thought this all had to do with my genetics or just all the things that we're um, exposed to. Right. But we see right things in our environment, like diet can have a major impact on what we call again, dysbiosis, right? So an unbalanced um, microbe or microbiome, the types of microbes that we have in our gut leading towards this uh chronic inflammation systemically, and then increasing this DNA instability, right? Leading to these epigenetic changes, therefore tumor onset and growth, right? Um, so it's very scientific. I know sometimes when I talk about the influence of diet um, on things like cancer or heart disease or anything else, it sound it starts sounding kind of hippie-ish, but um, there's a lot of science to go through on why um, diet has such a big impact on um, our overall health and specifically when we talk about cancer. So another good side. So what do we want our microbiome to look like, right? So we want to have low inflammation. We want to have a healthy microbiome. So what are some factors, some like takeaway messages that we can um, use. So basically environmental factors that we would want to focus on in the diet would be to increase diversity in the diet, um, to basically diversify the types of microbes that we have, right? We also want to limit things like antibiotics, um, un unless necessary, certain medications that can throw the microbiome off, like uh, proton pump inhibitors or PPI, right? Or classic omeprazole. Um, and also avoiding overuse of antibacterial um, and exposure to some amount of dirt is good, right? Some amount, right? So things like exposure to animals actually increases diversity in our microflora. Um, so those are some simple ways that we can um, basically increase diversity in our microbiome and um, combat basically the things that lead to um, disease, specifically cancer. And then when we talk about inflammation, again, some key takeaways. Um, so diet and inflammation, what do we know, right? So carbohydrates, um, there's been some studies done that have basically linked what types of carbohydrates can promote or um, prevent inflammation. So either increase inflammation or lower it. Um, and when we look at simple processed carbs, high glycemic index carbs, anything that's like refined grains, your white bread, your white pastas, all of that, that actually has been shown to increase inflammatory markers in the blood. Conversely, right, when you look at high fiber, whole carbs, things like potatoes, sweet potatoes, um, whole grains, right, that's actually um, anything with high fiber is going to lower um, inflammatory markers. And then when we look at fats, right, then what what type of fats do we, there's like a big debate out there, right? So we still see a pro-inflammatory um, tendency with our trans and saturated fats. So our trans fats are going to be any of our processed fats, our saturated fats, right? That's like your butter, your coconut oil, and that's a little controversial, but still the data is pretty strong for that being pro-inflammatory. And then our omega-6s go a little back and forth, and these are our seed oils, Um but for the most part, right, we see that those are pro-inflammatory. So those are things we want to avoid. And things that we would want to include in the diet would be um, fats that are rich in omega-3 and monounsaturated fats, right? So your fatty fish, your nuts, your seeds, your avocados, these actually lower infl inflammatory markers um, in our blood. And then we have um, diet and inflammation and how do, how does the diversity, right? How do our carotenoids, right? These carotenoids, these flavonoids, these properties that sound super fancy in our food, that is basically just a big way of saying you're eating a variety of fruits and vegetables, um, that are again, feeding the microbiome, fighting inflammation. So increased 
dietary carotenoids actually can lower inflammatory markers. And the same thing goes with our flavonoids, right? So getting a large bulk of our food from foods in their whole state um, is has been shown to be beneficial. So turning a corner. So that's all that we know about diet. So this is the diet that um, basically would have the potential to leverage your uh, anti-inflammation, optimize your microbiome, and impact these epigenetic changes um, is this anti-inflammatory picture of a diet, right? And then in contrast a little bit, right, we see what what do we know so far, which there's not a lot on fire, firefighter diet patterns. So um, with the little bit that's out there on firefighter um, diet, so this is not a comprehensive review, but um, I'm, I am going to review a few of the articles that are out there. So this was a study um, done with a sample of about 400 from Indianapolis. Um, so uh, fire. So basically what they did was they took um, food frequency questionnaires and they analyzed the data, right? And they looked for trends leaning towards both a Mediterranean diet, so an anti-inflammatory type of diet, and then a standard American diet. And what they found was kind of interesting. There was, those were the two um, most common dietary patterns that they can pull out from the food frequency questionnaire data, but there was overlap. So there was quite a bit of overlap between firefighters that um, reported following both a standard American diet and a Mediterranean diet, which is kind of interesting. Um, so um, the authors suppose that um, basically the standard American diet, right, which is like your pro-inflammatory, right, your fried foods, your hot dogs, hamburgers, anything, your pizza, things that you think about the standard American diet, your junk food, right? Unfortunately, standard American diet, the abbreviation is a sad diet. Um, so the thought was that this type of diet is more likely to be followed when they were on shift, right? So we have to feed the masses. What's the easiest thing to do? Let's grill some burgers. Let's, you know, put some fries or tots in the, in the oven, or now we have air fryers. Um, and, and eat that for lunch or dinner, right? And then when they were home, right, because firefighters do have a background in knowing these risks and knowing kind of like what they should be doing, then they followed more of this Mediterranean diet and tried to sort of um, balance the stuff they were eating in the firehouse with um, increasing their fruits and vegetables and whole food intake on the days that they were off. So it was kind of interesting. Um, and then another study here, so this looked at adherence to a Mediterranean diet. So they basically looked at what kind of diet firefighters reported they uh, were having um, and then associated those that had more of a tendency towards a Mediterranean diet pattern versus those that didn't and what were the differences in the sample. And what they found that um, those that had less adherence to a Mediterranean diet were more likely to be obese, more likely to be diagnosed with metabolic syndrome. They're more likely to report weight gain um, and also increased intake of fast foods and sugar-sweetened beverages. While those that uh, reported a greater adherence to Mediterranean diet um, had lower levels of LDL, which is our quote-unquote bad cholesterol, and higher levels of the protective HDL. And then this study was interesting. Um, this was a study that uh, was a survey-based study um, administered to members of the IAFF. And what it looked at um, was firefighter diet preferences, right? So we, we know what an anti-inflammatory diet looks like. Um, we know you sort of what we should be eating, um, but what do firefighters actually prefer to eat? And when we look at that data, it's pretty interesting because Again, it kind of um, speaks to the first study that firefighters report not really following any sort of particular diet plan, sort of wing it, um, which makes sense with the first uh, study showing us that there was this um, doubling, right, that they followed both the standard American diet and the Mediterranean diet. Like, how is that possible? Because they really don't follow any pattern. Every day is different depending on what's going on on shift, 
if they're on shift versus off shift, who's the chef, right? There's so many factors, how many calls you're getting. There's so many factors that play into that. So they actually reported not following any specific diet pattern and that they had a lack of information received about um, basically nutrition and diet and, and its relationship to health. And then a large part, right? So most of the firefighters in this particular study reported that they were interested in learning more about healthy eating, right? So you have that 75% that was like, I want to know more. I want to do this. Um, so there is an openness to um, diet and nutrition in the fire service, which is great. Um, so in comes our nutrition study. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Paul now to talk about our study on the assessment of firefighter diet quality and lifestyle behaviors. Um, he's going to tell you a little bit about the study and then I'll wrap up at the end with some shameless plugs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks so much, Amy. So as Amy mentioned, there are, um, a lot of, uh, Inflammatory, inflammatory uh, markers and responses that our bodies have towards different uh, different exogenous factors. Um, and using, looking at those known factors, things like sleep, uh, physical activity, alcohol intake, tobacco use, and diet, and most of all right now, uh, we we decided to choose our studies based, or our surveys based off of that. Um, there are, you know, just, just as a, you know, basic biology plug there for, for this there you know everybody looks at um genetics versus environment uh, what is affecting and they, they're both mutually they both have a huge part to play when it comes to cancer risk um you might be genetically susceptible to having a disease but the environment you know if, if you if you look at it straight from the genetic standpoint uh it's why there are some excellent diseases versus um where females are a little bit more uh, resistant to that when guys only have one, you know, they only have one X chromosome. So they have less room to work with when, uh, and so you'll notice certain genetic diseases that a woman may have the predisposition, um, but she may not always show any traits of it. She may not show a phenotype of it. Uh, while as a men, if they only have one X and it's an excellent disease, they're sure as heck going to show that much, much more frequently. Um, so that that has to do with the genetic portion of this, and there are a lot of genes out there, uh, not all not all just excellent, that can put you at risk. A lot of times we have a little bit of cushion in the fact that we have genes from both sides of our families, but if you have one gene that's out there uh, that that's a known risk factor for a cancer, uh, we see it with the BRCA one, BRCA two. It doesn't always mean you're going to have the cancer, but it means that your likelihood is higher. Now, how do we prevent anything else from happening? Well. Beyond genetics, there are changes to our genotype based off based off of environmental factors. So, a gene doesn't mean that that gene will be expressed. And so, by doing the best we can in terms of diet, in terms of you know looking at things like inflammation, in terms of limiting uh, known carcinogen risks and exogenous factors, that's how we can. That's those are things that we can possibly change. You can't change your genetics, but you can change your, uh, for the most part, your uh, your your ability to you know your your lifestyle choices um diet and and then inflammatory inflammation in your body that those those are some of the things that we can do to you know reduce that so looking at that uh this this survey uh we, we took a few surveys in order to to kind of quantify this in addition we looked at the um the work data as well as the uh work history data and um just uh basic um basic uh gender data and um the uh, and the we also for some people who opted for it we did the carotenoid to palm and finger scan to try to have a objective quantification of uh of essentially you know your antioxidant effect throughout within the skin so for diet we use a dietary screener questionnaire to dsq for physical activity we looked at the go to leisure time and exercise questionnaire for sleep uh the pittsburgh sleep quality index and morningness eveningness questionnaire and for alcohol intake, we utilize the alcohol use disorder identification test, um, the audit C. So, and I'll tell you, so a lot of uh, this sometimes falls into a realm of uh, of up and coming new new sciences that, you know, haven't, you know, things that aren't always uh, 
100% uh, evidence based just yet and this is a newer this is a newer technology for me it's been done for a while i had to research this when amy brought it up to my attention cuz to be honest as a practitioner uh, I don't always see this. This is not a test that's done at your daily physical. It's not, it's not, in, and, it, and it can be very useful. Um, it took a lot of uh, uh, PubMed researching uh, to see, you know, see that it is a validated method for, for looking at, you know, your overall intake of colorful fruits and vegetables via your skin. I had never heard about this before. Um, so what does it mean? So what it does is that it essentially looks at the refractory refraction within your, and uh, for certain light fields, Within your skin to guess to me how you know your your really your anti it's almost it's looking at you like a blueberry are you highly antioxidant or low antioxidant and it can tell whether or not uh, you know, what range you fall into now the typical American range is 200 to 300 um, 200 to 400 is where we get at average so you, um, and above 400 is above average the goal is to be 200 or above um, and this is based granted this is based on the U.S. population so as you know the U.S. may not be the best uh, the, the best place to look for, uh, for, for a varied diet. Uh, we are highly processed. Um, I love that she was mentioning the, 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 looking at the, 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 the simple sugars and simple carbohydrates and the complex carbohydrates. We can have white, we, I was talking to her the other day, we have white pasta here, which has a significantly higher, uh, glycemic index, uh, uh index than white pasta made in, uh, in Italy. So the reason why is because we process so much that we denature proteins so that your body just absorbs it and it just quickly turned into sugar versus their slow classic way of making pasta. It's essentially like you're eating a whole wheat pasta, even though it's white. So there's significant differences. Same thing with uh, white rice versus brown rice. Um, it depends where you get the white rice. Uh, you know, if you go to Japan, they wash your carbohydrates off the rice. If you have sushi, that rice is actually not a high uh, high glycemic index, even though it's white. It's actually lower than some of our some of our uh, some of our brown rices. But it's just things like that that just show that the over processing of our food does have negative effects. So as whole foods you can be, as Mediterranean diet, as low inflammatory diets you can be, you can be that there are some significant changes there. But back to this, I kind of uh, I have a tendency to to run off. Uh, and that was just like a little soapbox there. Um, so looking at this sample, so there's a sample of 61 firefighters, not that large, but hope we're, we're currently still actively enrolling and looking to expand this. Um, so work status, 87% were currently active. Uh, we had 3% retired. The 5% unknown, I'm still trying to figure out. I was joking about that earlier today, uh, but there are there is people coming onboarding and off off kind of in the process of retiring that or just out for injury or anything else that that can be a part of uh gender wise it kind of goes similar to what it looks similar to how the rest of the population of firefighters are um a, a more of a male predominance uh, so at uh, 85 to 15 85 percent male to 50 percent female uh, but that can definitely vary and that you know um yeah okay there we go uh, race, uh, so 92% uh, Caucasian, 7% uh, African-American or Black, uh, and 2% unknown. With regards to ethnicity, non-Hispanic made up for 74% of the study, um, while 25% were Hispanic and 1% did not know, which is actually more common than you think. Marital status, and this is always, uh, when, I'm, when I'm speaking about firefighters, always I love looking at how uh, the their demographic changes once they get from their mid twenties, mid thirties into their forties, and so this is a good a good spread here. So unmarried one is unmarried seven percent for unmarried couples, fifty percent for divorced or separated, fifty four percent for married, um, one percent single, and or sorry, um, and then an unknown. I still trying to figure that one out. Uh, for for education level. High school graduate was 8%. Some college was 54%. And 38% were high school, uh, college graduates. Now looking here, we're looking, these are the actual uh, mean and standard uh, standard deviations. So for age, the mean age was 42, uh, about 42 to 43 uh, years old with a standard, uh, very, uh, standard deviation of 12 to 13. The golden scale score was 57.76. Uh, uh, so that just tells us that uh, you know a level of above 24 is considered to be relatively active, very active. Um, 
And so that makes sense. Our firefighters are constantly doing things. They have time to, they have a uh, time in the middle of the day too, that they're supposed to be or within the week to adequately work out. Um, and it's a very physical job. So that does not surprise us at all. It also kind of tells us, you know, the typical uh, mentality is, you know, I'll eat, but I'll work it off later, but that does not always work. I mean, I've lived that life too. Um, sometimes I'm going to work out so I can eat the way I like. It doesn't always mean anything for inflammation. It might help you with your overall calorie intake and weight management, but with regards to inflammatory diet or inflammatory potential of your body, it doesn't really uh, pan out too well. Uh, the average carotenoid score was 273.03, and that that falls within you know the the average population in the U.S. Is that good or bad? That's I think that needs to be a little more standardized. I'd love to see a worldwide uh, number, um, or at least a number from other other uh, nations. But that does fall within our the, the normal average for U.S. Uh, for career, the where we did see some interesting stuff was with career versus volunteer of. Uh, so career, it was at 293.5 and career and volunteer was at 215. So it was a, uh, or 238. There's a difference between the volunteer and career firefighters. Could it be a change in a diet from when you're eating in while on service versus what you're eating? If you're more likely to be eating at home, is there a change there? That's something that needs to be investigated a little further. Um, discussion wise. So the firefighters, the cranoid scores are similar to that of the general population. Firefighters are more physically active than the general population, which I don't think comes as a surprise to anybody, but this is a very small sample size. It's not very powered, um, and further analysis needs to be done. Not all analysis has been completed as of yet, um, so a larger sample size is needed to better estimate the diet quality and lifestyle behaviors of the, of the fire service, as well as follow-up testing and follow-up uh, surveys to you know further characterize this. This is just the tip of the iceberg as we uh, continue to start uh, delving into this. We're hoping to find more information that can help help us uh, promote ad, uh, changes to lifestyle that prevent cancer in firefighters. Thank you, Dr. Polk. So next step, so these are going to be my shameless plugs. So basically, this is um, our um, flyer, our IRB approved flyer here for our diet um, or nutrition study. Um, with the link there. So um, we do have, for those of you that don't know, we have our International Firefighter Cancer Symposium coming up right around the corner, um, February 22nd through the 24th. Um, so if you haven't registered, go register. Um, and you're if you do register and attend um, and you're able to, we will be recruiting um, for this nutrition study there. So you'll have an opportunity to help further um, this data that we definitely need to grow this sample size. Um, so if you're interested, um, register, come see us. Um, and if you have need any additional information, feel free to reach out. Um, also additional resources. So we have our firefighter um, toolkit app that launched last year, um, so about a year ago in the symposium, this has um, nutrition resources already there. We're also working with our dietetics team to come up with even more resources for you guys, because um, that's something that we heard you guys want. That's the feedback we always get, and we take it and we run with it. So that is uh, a resource for you. We also have our education curriculum, um, which we do present live and then there is an option for virtual which we are working on um, as we speak some different virtual platforms for that um, that does cover both cancer um, in the fire service and the occupational interventions and nutrition so if that's something that you're interested in for your department feel free to reach out and then we also have our firefighter clinic that is geared specifically to towards firefighters um, I am the nurse practitioner that sees um, all the firefighters um, on our clinic. We have the capability for telemedicine visits. So if you're interested in receiving more um, personalized um, information on diet, lifestyle, and how those things can be impacting your cancer risk or other um, health um, conditions, feel free to reach out um, as well. And these are the references. And then I will stop sharing and turn it back over to Dr. Kaban and Natasha, Dr. Sully. 
Great job. Now, that was an amazing presentation. Thank you both for presenting the work on nutrition. I know it's such a hot topic and interesting topic for our firefighters. Um, so we have a couple of questions that came through the chat. Um, one that um, I will go through briefly, it was a little bit longer. Um, there seems to be a focus on behavioral choice and increase in cancer risk on firefighters. We know that behavior can definitely increase cancer risk. Uh, but the reality of our job is we are regularly put into contact with known and unknown carcinogens as part of our work duty. Um, so how would, um, you know, the fear they have is that by placing blame on off-duty behavior factors, we're absolving the responsibility of our employers to provide better PPE, engineering controls, and workplace practices. How do you square this dichotomy of occupational versus behavioral risk? So, so if I can, jump, can I jump in first go, and talk go. about the safety part, and then I'm going to pivot over to my colleagues, Dr. Green and Paul, to, to sort of chime in, right? So when we think of the outcome of cancer risk, right, what we would like to do as occupational health and safety professionals is lower cancer risk. But what? how do you get to cancer risk? What is that number and how do you estimate it? Well, there's a lot of different factors that go into that cancer risk. And I think, um, Joe, you're highlighting Two of, two of many, which is right the, the individual person's behavior and then what they're exposed to while they're in the workplace. So when Dr. Green and Paul started our conversation this afternoon on the seminar, we were talking about how the, a major one is the genetics mom and dad gave us, right? You, you already have a deck of cards from mom and dad that are going to dictate what your potential cancer risk can or cannot be for certain types of cancers. Then when you go into the work setting, you have all these different um, exposures and behaviors that we, we engage in or are exposed to that, that toggle that value of cancer risk. Like, does it get higher or lower for you individually as a firefighter? And so a person's individual behaviors, whether they choose to exercise, whether they choose to wear a seatbelt, whether they choose to do decontamination procedures on scene, whether um, they work out for 30 minutes while they're on shift, all those individual behaviors um, can and cannot contribute to it. So some of the earlier slides were talking about the cancer risk among the general American population for exercising or not exercising, right? Those are individual choice behaviors that are there. And then they are either, they either compound or synergistic to some of the occupational exposures. The reality is we will never be able to get down to zero risk. We want to be able to provide as minimal risk from occupational and non-occupational exposures to different carcinogens, including the choices that we make, right? And so what we think about a concept called total worker health, which is how can we leverage the workspace, the environment in which we work, the workflow, and how we get from point A to B during our shift that we can uh, modify to reduce that cancer risk. And so I'm gonna pivot over to um, Dr. Green and Dr. Pope because I think in the nutrition space, like what fuel we put into our bodies, when we put that fuel into our bodies, right? Depending if we're sleep deprived, if we're full of energy and all that can definitely impact that cancer risk profile. Yeah. And I mean, I usually, when I see um, patients in clinic or when I teach, you know, our education curriculum, I always tell them I see exposures as broadly, right? So again, that total worker health approach that you're talking about, Dr. Caban. So I don't see it compartmentalized. So sometimes we tend to compartmentalize, be it our exposures or, you know, what I do at work versus what I do at home. What about, you know, the PFAS? What about the PAHs? What about, but right, looking at your exposure broadly as everything that you do every single day, everything that you're exposed to, be it at work or at home, is either has the potential to promote or prevent disease, right? We're not in control of everything. So we can only control what we control. Um, so I don't like to use it to scare people, but instead empower um, firefighters to feel like I do. I think we may have lost you, Dr. Green. At least I can't hear you. Or maybe I'm having a stroke right now. Okay. Yeah. I think no, no I, I think I think we you. lost you. Amy, we okay. can't hear you. I, we can't. Okay. I'll be I I agree with Amy. So be able still to going. visualize this. Oh, <laughs> back on. Go ahead. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, being able to compartmentalize uh this is very important. Every field will have its risk factors and uh by by uh, oh, I think paying more attention just... to by paying more attention to uh to what we do outside of work 
it in no ways uh, uh, lessens the risks you have while on the job or with uh, the occupational hazards. And so those are two separate entities in my book. Uh, we do everything we can on all fronts to reduce cancer risks. Mm -hmm. And so what you do at home does translate, but it, it's what you do at home. It's what, we, what you do uh, to, to just be healthy and prevent, you know, not just cancer, but think about this. This all these diets, the Mediterranean diet um, or the, the, the Japanese diet has shown significant reductions in cardiovascular uh, risk. Um, there, there are so many other issues with American diet that we need to touch upon as well, not just cancer. Now, we still need to do as much work as we can on the occupational side because everybody takes, to be a firefighter, you're taking risks in your occupation, but cancer really shouldn't be one of them. So it in no way lessens that. Sorry, I'm not sure how, how much you guys got there, but <laughs> yes, I I do see, Um, I always tell my firefighters that I see their exposures as very broad, right? So we want to think about everything that you're coming in contact with, be it at home, at work, right? And not everything do we have control over, right? So instead of this gloom, doom, oh my gosh, this is, you know, it's the PFAS is in our water, what can we do, right? coming up with more of an empowering approach as to, okay, we know these are risk factors. What can I do? What's in my power to mitigate those risks, be it following a decontamination procedure, be it following a Mediterranean diet, be it taking the time to exercise, all those things, right? And we talk about things like behavior stacking, right? It doesn't mean that you have to go from eating fast food to, you know, all of a sudden following a Mediterranean diet, but this behavior stacking kind of approach so that you empower yourself to control what you can control and the rest is the rest. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I do want to encourage, like, um, there's a great documentary on Netflix called um, Blue Zones, mm -hmm. and it highlights um, these four uh, communities across um, the world that live a long time um you know into their centurion and it's very interesting to learn about their practices you know, like their behaviors their diets their physical activity that go towards supporting longevity um in there um, i just encourage you if you're curious about sort of diet and nutrition to examine and just uh, explore with it and it's called uh, blue zones on netflix not that i'm encouraging subscriptions to netflix but um <laughs> it is a good one so netflix and chill um there's another question in here uh, we claim to suffer from the healthy worker effect, suggests we're fit and healthy, which confounds our cancer statistics. Wow, that's this awesome um, observation. Yeah, we see that a 9% increase in cancer incidence and 14 increase in mortality, despite the healthy worker effect. Okay, so let me just make a comment on healthy worker effect. Um, so this is an observation that nerds that do epidemiology and biostats say of data when you're looking at occupational health data. And I'll give you an example. So um, Dr. Bolton Green presented earlier in the seminar some slides looking at national level statistics for cancer risk among the American population and um, their risk for cancer. When you compare that same data against American workers, meaning you pull out everybody that's a worker and not a worker, the data in the worker population is gonna look better, meaning that they will have less disease and better engagement and act in different positive behaviors that we think about. So that observation that workers tend to on the surface appear healthier and have better statistics compared to the general population is what's termed the healthy worker effect. And that's an important phenomenon because whenever someone's presenting you statistics about uh, one population against another, if they're looking at workers, the workers are just gonna look better because you have to be healthy and fit in order to do the job. So therefore it does look better. So in the comment in our seminar saying that yes, firefighters still have a 9% overall increase in incidence and 4% and 14% in mortality, that comes from the NIOSH um, study. Dr. Doug Daniels had published a study um, looking at um, Philadelphia, San Francisco, um, uh, and Chicago as fire departments to estimate um, cancer risk. And yes, it is true that firefighters are an elevated risk of cancer compared to the general population because of what you are exposed to and happens to you at work. That added contribution of the occupational health exposure does increase that risk. And so we, we call it the healthy worker effect when you see those differences in those estimates. Um, so we have one hand up and, oh, sorry, go ahead, John. No, 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 go ahead. Um, 
uh, we got another question that said, um, you know, thank you for a nice presentation. Considering that inflammation and oxidative stress are intercorrelated and both are involved in cancer development. Where'd it go? Oh, it was just removed. <laughs> I think it was about how to measure reactive oxygen. Um, oh, yes. Here we go. Do you have any suggestions on how to measure yeah. So I had to look this up. There is some testing out there that's very new technology on measuring um reactive oxygen species to to date. That's not something that we've measured. Um we do look at things like monitoring um of infl inflammatory markers in the blood in both our uh, clinical population and and in some of our uh, research projects um to see if that's a trend and then the veggie meter right is a great way of um measuring at least the antioxidant um, status that then would be able to buffer that ROS. Um, but there is technology out there, so it's pretty interesting, but it's very, very, very new. So I'm um, not sure on the application just yet in firefighters, but it, that is something that um, can be looked into. And then also on the healthy worker effect, right? It also depends on how you're defining health and, you know, is health the absence of disease or is it kind of like that blue zone picture of actual optimal health and, you know, taking that into account, not just, you know, not having a diagnosis. Yeah. The, the, the oxidative stress, um, the being able to measure that I I've seen, I've seen the new measure. I mean, it's just not validated yet. It's just mm -hmm. not very well validated yet. It's very so new. It's hard, it's hard to, it's hard to do anything based off of that, but markers of inflammation and total body inflammation, that is one of the biggest, hottest topics right now in medicine, both, I mean, on both sides for me, for on the orthopedic side, for sure, because anytime, you know, we see somebody with post-injury, post-possible joint infection, we're trying to measure specific inflammatory markers for each joint and a bunch of these in arthritis. We're looking at like different uh, phenotypes for arthritis bases based off markers of inflammation. Um, the classic ones we have are like the CRP and the ESR, but we're breaking that down now like, much more so. Um, rheumatology is, is blowing up. Um, they have, uh, I mean, their rheumatoid, there's how many times do people have uh, something called seronegative rheumatoid um, illnesses or musculoskeletal disorders, uh, which mm -hmm. means that you look like you have rheumatoid arthritis, you look like you have psoriatic arthritis or something, but all your tests are coming back negative for those specific markers. And so they call it seronegative. So markers of inflammation, a very, very hot topic. And to be honest with you, medicine, we're... I don't feel that we're at the place we need to be just yet to have a really, you know, we have stuff that we're trying and that we're working on. Um, we have a lot of things that are promising, but we haven't been able to correlate them fully yet to with specific diseases or with just general oxidative stress in the body. Um, you have some individuals who are doing, and it's, um, my sports medicine hat, um, I just had a couple NFL players come in today who are telling me that they're getting... Uh, Prolozone or pro, then you have people out in the field doing things like that. And that's prolozone essentially is ozone therapy. CDC is, uh, FDA is very, uh, or CDC is very against ozone therapy. It's, it's an extra free radical in your body. That's giving you the axis, it's, it's, it's the oxidant. You know, antioxidants, we're giving you an oxidant. Why? I have no idea. Uh, but they, <laughs> the way that they're, uh, they're injecting and doing a blood transfusion with ozone therapy. Um, the newer version slightly safer because it's not giving people uh, emboli or strokes, but, and and they're, they're using that for different reasons that I would love to see. I would love to have a good mark of inflammation and also just, you know, uh, free radicals in the person's body, just so we can see how that can ne possibly negatively affect the person. Uh, but then this, uh, this individual paid about uh, 7,500 bucks to, to do three sessions of this. So it's, Anywhere, the issue I have is that anytime there's something that's uh, monetary, it could be a very lucrative and it kind of takes away from the science. Um, but short answer, sorry, well, once again, on that soapbox, short answer is we, there is no good test just yet, but there's a lot of things in the pipe work. Um, and as this is becoming more and more, uh, more and more looked at, more and more uh, popular, it it's only a matter of time before the bigger companies start, you know, investing more research is being done. Yeah. And there's also epigenetic, you know, tests that, you know, we do in some of our research yeah. projects and there's even, you know, companies now that will do kind of like a biological age test, age, biological age. Yes. And, yeah. you know, kind of yeah. tell yeah. you you're either older than what you're supposed to be or younger than what you're supposed to be and use that as like a marker of this antioxidant status, right? Because we know that 
part of the aging process is this increase in the reactive oxygen species, right? So how can we lower that? How can we lower our, our biological age? So there's all kinds of new stuff coming out. Look, but look at that guy who makes a million dollars a month to uh, <laughs> try to stay young. If anybody's seen that guy like, no. with his son, oh, gosh, he's <laughs> great kid. Yeah, I wanted just to do like a quick scientific comment on that. And I very much appreciate my colleagues like clinical, um, you know, guidance, which is dead on, right? Like you need a good solid technology to be able to test this and make sure that what you're measuring is accurate. Because I know we get a lot of uh, contact from our firefighters talking about like, is this a legit test, you know, for me to use to evaluate this? Um, you know, from a scientific perspective, as we're evaluating, um, you know, oxidative stress and parameters and DNA damage in firefighters, which is really important. I think doing very focused experimental designs where we're testing it in a very controlled environment to understand the aspect of one exposure. So our other previous question was talking about overall cancer risk. And when we do our estimates, like firefighters are exposed to so many different things in the workplace. We tend to focus on like one thing, but their exposure is truly like Dr. Green says, it's there's a lot of different things so you know focusing on one uh focused experimental design to measure oxidative stress would be something to think about um you know there's a paper out of south korea that they evaluated the use of treadmill walking on oxidative stress and we're evaluating if like you're wearing ppe does that increase um or have the same standard of oxidative stress right those these sort of like very um, narrow uh, experimental designs are really important to do these assessments. So we know piecemeal what the impact is of one parameter on oxidative stress. And if you're curious, they did find in that study that um, wearing PPE during um, a treadmill uh, test increases oxidative stress um, in those firefighters. All right, Dr. Sully, do we got any other questions? No, Seeing for no, uh, for now. So thank you all for being here just to, uh, close up and just, some um, uh, final logistics. So we will not be having a monthly seminar series next month. Uh, we will be in person at the Donna Shalala center in Coral Gables for our annual international firefighter cancer symposium. Uh, we hope to see all of you there, if not in person online, uh, registration is free. It's a hybrid event. Um, so Thursday is a full day. We have some really amazing speakers coming uh, from all over the world to present on the latest research on cancer in the fire service, and then a half day on Friday. Um, Thursday will also close out the evening uh, with a scientific poster session and a networking event. So we would love to see all of you. If you have any questions about um, how to register, you can find everything online. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. As I said, everything is free. And so we hope uh, we'll see you there. Uh, following our symposium, our next seminar series is in March. Um, and that will be uh, myself and Ms. Cynthia Beaver. And we will be talking about our cancer survivorship program. So mm -hmm. thank you guys so much and stay safe. Bye, everyone.